Hi, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here, the China History Podcast. We're back with part two of our discussion with Perry Link, Paul Pickowitz, and Jeremy Murray. We're talking about their new book called China Tripping, Encountering the Everyday in the People's Republic. Let's continue on with part two. Why don't we have one more round of stories, Paul? Why don't you uh, read one more, Perry, okay. and then uh, Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, so I started with my earliest one, and let me skip all the way from 1971 to 2010. Uh, <laughs> I'm still going back to China, and this story is called Avoiding Long Lines. I should have called this, though, I Love Naughty People. <laughs> uh, so let me get into it. Uh, in spring of 2010, uh, I was teaching a course on silent era Chinese cinema of the 1920s and 30s at East China Normal University in Shanghai. Uh, I had more than 40 students, half undergraduates and half graduate students. The school set me up in a very comfortable apartment on the grounds of its spiffy new campus in the Minhang suburb. The new campus was glittering, but a bit nondescript. It would not have been out of place in Iowa or South Dakota, except, of course, for the uniformed security guards who policed every entrance. On weekends, it was very quiet on campus, a bit too quiet. On occasion, I was bored. The students seemed bored every weekend. Once in a while, a few students and I would take the shuttle bus into the city and spend pleasant hours strolling around the old French concession, looking for surviving Art Deco buildings of the 1920s, uh, talking about architecture, looking for hidden away former residences of people like Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, and searching out funky coffee shops. Now, the Grand Shanghai World Expo opened while I was there. Every time I met my class, the students asked, have you been to the expo yet? I responded the same way each time. Sorry, it's not my kind of thing. I can't stand crowds like that, and I positively hate to stand in long lines for anything. Now, the press was reporting waits of two to three hours for some of the most popular pavilions, including the Japanese exhibition. To make matters worse, as the expo progressed, the weather became hotter and hotter. Have you been to the expo yet, they repeated. Long lines, too hot, no way, I repeated. Worried about terrorist attacks and bad publicity of any sort, the police conducted airport-type security checks at the entrance to all Shanghai subway stops and prohibited the sale of knives, meat cleavers, and rat poison. <laughs> but some of the students wouldn't take no for an answer. These are the naughty ones I was talking about. One of them showed up in class with a free expo ticket for me. Very clever. How could I say no, I thought to myself. I agreed to go, but I protested again about long lines. I won't stand there like a fool in a two-hour line. I don't care how good the exhibits are. But the students, a few closet-wise guys among them, were several steps ahead of me. We've thought about that already. We have a plan that will be very interesting, but avoid long lines. Trust us. Eager to know more about this ingenious plan, I asked for the details. They said, we've done a bit of research. Instead of going to the most popular pavilions, we will visit the least popular. There will be no lines, and we can try our best to figure out why these places are so unpopular. I couldn't resist quizzing them about what their research had shown. Which is the most unpopular pavilion, I asked. That's easy, they responded. North Korea. <laughs> we'll visit that one first. This was very mischievous, but I had to admit that they had my full attention now, and I was looking uh, forward uh, to the trip. Upon arrival at the sprawling and jam-packed expo, we headed immediately to the North Korea Pavilion. Would the students be able to keep a straight face? Would I be able to keep a straight face? Walking over to the North Korea Pavilion, we passed the Japan Pavilion. I went to the end of the line and asked the last person standing how much time it would take to get in. Probably two and a half hours, he said, smiling. Finally, we reached the North Korea Pavilion. It was small and featured bare-bones construction. There was no one in line, not even one person. 
The one-room interior was sparse, a small artificial tea garden, some large propaganda photos, a bank of TV monitors showing propaganda documentaries, and a couple of counters selling souvenirs. The space was practically empty, except for four or five Korean staff members, all of whom spoke very good Chinese. There was nothing to do, so I thought the visit would last only a few minutes and we would be on our way to the next no-line stop. But then I noticed that among the souvenirs being sold were North Korean postage stamps. As an avid collector of Asian stamps, I was instantly attracted to the display. I spoke at great length in Chinese to the middle-aged Korean man behind the counter. I gave him my card, and he gave me his. You're an American, he said. I am an American stamp collector, I responded. I added that this was the very first pavilion of my visit to the expo. Slowly but surely, a crowd began to gather, everyone eager to hear what we were saying. I ended up buying one of everything in order to launch my North Korean stamp collection. <laughs> the bill was over 900 yuan, but $125. No doubt the largest sale of the day, perhaps their largest sale of the expo. <laughs> At one point, I looked up at the crowd and noticed a fancy video camera filming the spectacle. Who is that, I wondered. As I walked away, the cameraman came over to me. He said he was from Shanghai TV and asked if he could interview me on camera. Sure, why not, I said. He thought the whole thing was a curious human interest story and wanted to work out a good script. He said, I'll ask you why you're in Shanghai, and you'll say you're a visiting American professor at East China Normal. Then I'll ask you why you chose to visit the North Korea Pavilion first. Then after you answer that, please hold up the stamp packets so everyone can see. My students could barely contain themselves. With the camera rolling, we finally got to the part about why I chose North Korea first. I didn't have the heart to tell the truth. I wanted to blame the students for the awkward situation I was in. Instead, I simply said that since the U.S. and North Korea have no diplomatic relations, this was a rare opportunity for me to meet some North Koreans and have a friendly chat, people-to-people -people diplomacy. When I, discovered this, uh, when I discovered the stamps, I explained, it made the friendly back-and-forth chat very easy and very pleasant. The cameraman was delighted with this charming story. Outside, I chided my unruly students. Look at the trouble you guys got me into, I quipped. Come on, hurry up, they responded. Laos is over here. <laughs> Perry Link, what do you have? I'll read the piece that was my last trip to China, literally, from 1996, called A Night at the Moven Pick. On the evening of July 8, 1996, I arrived at Beijing Capital Airport after a long two-leg flight from Newark, New Jersey. I was coming to Beijing to give a lecture and to meet students and faculty at the Princeton in Beijing Summer Language Program, of which I was a co-director. Friends from Princeton in Beijing were waiting for me outside the airport. In those days, the Beijing airport still bore some of the quaint flavor of the Mao era. Drab walls, ceiling fans, luggage carousels built of wooden slats. The spanking new construction that came with the city's hosting of the 2008 Summer Olympics was still far in the future. Passport control did have new computers, though, and when my turn in line came, a young officer squinted at his monitor rather longer than one would think he had to, and then told me in halting English to take a seat and wait a moment. About an hour later, another uniformed man, middle-aged with a long, serious face, returned to say in Chinese, research on me done, done during that hour apparently had revealed that I could speak Chinese, came to me to say, quote, we have checked with our superiors and you are not welcome in our country. I pointed out that I had a double entry Chinese visa and asked what the problem was. He said nothing. He pointed an index finger upward and fixed me with a look. I had arrived on a late flight and there were no return flights to the United States until the next morning. This made me a problem for him and his colleagues who needed to figure out where to put me overnight 
Uh, and that can explain at least part of my hour-long wait, I think. In the end, four young plainclothes policemen accompanied me to the United Airlines ticket counter. One of them, with a crew cut and bushy eyebrows, was the leader of the four. He told the United agent on duty that the airline had brought into China a passenger whose papers were unacceptable and said that the airline would need to provide a hotel room for one night. United, apparently preferring a minor expense to involvement in a visa dispute, paid for a room at the nearby and very upscale Movenpick Hotel. And the four young policemen and I went there to spend the night. Officially, I had not entered China. The four young policemen smoked, and I don't, but other than that, I suffered no mistreatment. I was brushing my teeth late at night, and the bushy-browed leader read me in English the formal police language that he was obliged to read. You cannot leave our company, you cannot make a phone call, you cannot this, you cannot that, and so on, about eight items in all. I just nodded my head and kept on brushing my teeth, accepting everything. The phone call rule was especially relevant because, moments earlier, my only request had been to make a phone call to my friends outside the airport who were waiting for me to emerge. I wanted to tell them to go home and not to worry. But the leader said this was not permitted, and, to emphasize the point, he had his colleagues unplug the telephone in the room and place it underneath big pillows on the beds. After the official rules had been read, the speech of the four young policemen shifted to an informal register. I'll interject here that my aha moment in this story is really the nature of those young plainclothes police who were inside the system and from one point of view, fearsome police, and from another point of view, just ordinary uh, human beings with which you could make friends. After the official rules had been read, the speech of the four young policemen shifted to an informal register. They appeared to be ordinary young men working for the police on an as-needed assignment. We spoke in Chinese, which seemed to relax them. They expressed puzzlement that my Chinese tones were correct. How did that happen? Is your wife Chinese? And then they moved to, on to questions like, uh, how much does your watch cost? And other kinds of questions that young Chinese people normally ask. They were glad to be with me in the Moven pick because the police system provided meal coupons for special assignment work. So tonight, they had a special opportunity to eat in the fancy restaurant on the ground floor. It was already past 11 p.m., but never mind. They wanted dinner. One suddenly turned to me. You must be hungry. No, I said, come on, I'm trivia. let's eat a bit. Rule one, though, had said that I could not leave their company, and that meant, too, that they could not leave mine. So they had a problem. I'm not hungry, I said. Truly, I wasn't hungry. I just wanted to sleep. An awkward pause ensued. Uh, we have coupons. One of them said. I asked. Do you have a coupon for me? I knew, of course, that they didn't. I was just teasing. Uh, no, sir, we don't. Uh, they used the word xianxiang, marking a clear distance from the gruff officialese that they had used when reading the rules to me. Then what am I going to eat? I continued my teasing. You can pay your own way, they answered. I still refused. They consulted and decided to take turns. Three of them went down to eat, while one, smoking and chatting, stayed with me watching television. When those three came back, the one who had accompanied me went down for his free dinner. The next morning, they took me back to the airport to the United counter for check-in. The United agent said, the flight is full. They said, if this passenger is not on the flight, the airplane will not leave the airport. I doubt that this was an idle threat. Uh, in any case, United did find me a seat, and I headed back to Newark. The cabin crew, who were the same crew that had been on the flight that had flown in the previous day, expressed surprise that I had finished my work in China so expeditiously. Very good. What year was this? 
96. Uh, okay. Well, Jeremy. All right. Something more modern. <laughs> Something. Jumping back to 2008. And this one is called Mainlander. In the late summer of 2008, while living on China's southern island of Hainan, I compulsively followed the distant American news cycle. Even on my snail-paced internet connection, I tried to stay abreast of every twist and turn in the final weeks of the Obama-McCain presidential race. I would wait hours while my laptop connection buffered the latest episode of Meet the Press. Like many Americans, I was exhausted by eight years of bungling imperial leadership, and I was eager to see a new administration begin repairing the damage. During the final weeks of the second Bush's second term, the long days dragged heavily in the Hainan heat. The humidity was relentless, and the nights were sometimes too hot for sleep, until a friend suggested a trick. Soak a towel, wring out as much water as possible, then lay it flat over the mattress and sleep on it for a cooling effect. In the morning, the towel and the mattress were dry, and even on the hottest nights, you could get some sleep. Now it was just the fate of the Union keeping me awake. I lived on the campus of Hainan University, Haida, in the island's provincial capital of Haiko, on its north coast. I was conducting doctoral research on the communist revolutionary movement there. While my research kept me busy, I was always eager to talk about American politics with friends, always primed to relate my frustrations, anxieties, and hopes. Then, in October, with the election only days away, I was invited by the university's Communist Youth League to give a talk about American history and Sino-U.S. relations. The students in the Youth League were a bright and thoughtful group from all around China. They were cheerful and even seemed enthusiastic to hear the talk. I had planned a sober discussion of opium, Anson Burlingame, The Open Door, Hu Shi, Joseph Stilwell, Zhou Enlai, and the possibility of a new special relationship. But my overheated and agitated state on the eve of the American election led me somehow to shift gears into a raving Jeremiah on the dangerous and myopic foreign policy of the outgoing American administration. I ended with some choice and frothy words about the president's officious and obnoxious religiosity and his Christian moralizing and righteousness, which was typical, I felt, of American exceptionalism. I didn't hold back, and the stunned faces in the audience made me quickly feel I'd overstepped. A polite reception followed, but the room was mostly quiet. With generous smiles and nods, everyone filed out. I knew one of the students as a neighbor, and we walked back toward the dorms together, mostly in silence. I finally asked him if he thought I was out of line. Well, I guess maybe we felt a little awkward, but I enjoyed it. And I agreed with most of it, except for the end, to be honest. My mom is a Christian, and she prays every day. From the way you spoke, I think maybe you don't know enough Christian. In the Hainan summer and well into the autumn, the hot nights are lively and boisterous with night markets, sports, and other communal fun. Since most Hainanese take a long midday nap to get them through the hottest hours of the day, they don't finally turn in until very late in the evening. The summer, the, the custom makes perfect sense, but many mainlanders consider it to be a mark of the characteristic indolence of the, quote, backward islanders. I eventually adopted the schedule myself. After finishing an afternoon evening session in the library, I would venture out for a late dinner and some exercise at eight or nine at night. The hardest hitting volleyball matches I've ever seen began after sundown on the campus's sand courts under orange floodlights. But the best players were all ringers, local guys who weren't students. They showed up to take over the courts as soon as they got off work, cigarettes in their mouths and two or three tall beer bottles in each hand. Most of the students who had been playing, playfully, playfully patting a ball back and forth, didn't need to be asked to move on when the ringers arrived. It only took a few spikes, delivered with a shout of, Washa! I kill, to make most of the daunted Haida students head for the basketball courts. After about a week of trying to join, I was normalized into the games, but only after running a gauntlet of target practice. Washa, bump, set. Washa, bump, set. Washa, bump, set. Washa. In those first few games, I suspected that some of our side's blockers neglected their duties and intentionally allowed a few spikes to come whistling through just to see the La Wai the foreigner get a bloody nose. Either way, I had to play a few games with wads of reddened toilet paper in both nostrils. The ringers were mostly tall and wiry, fishermen, cooks, construction workers, cab drivers. When they leapt, their feet left the sand and they seemed to hover for a leisurely moment as they aimed and hammered home a perfect kill 
Washa. Then they floated down to survey the damage. Beers and smokes between the games were friendly, but the chatter was mostly in Hainanese, and I understood only a few words. Eventually, someone might welcome me back into the conversation in Mandarin. In spite of my enjoyment of the game and the company, my one-track obsession with American politics would still inexorably turn the talk from their jokes in Hainanese to some glum pap about Bush, McCain, and Obama, conveyed in my wooden Mandarin, Putonghua. The conversation would splutter and clunk and then stop altogether. I was a downer. After a glum moment or two, a few eye rolls and a rallying hand clap, it was a relief for everyone to return to the game in high spirits. Hey man, somebody offered from across the net. You talk like a mainlander. I think he meant both my stiff accent and my sober conversation. Study our Hainan Island, he said, and you'll learn to relax. May I make a comment here? You may. Uh, I love this story uh, because it talks about regional difference in China. Uh, and that's something, again, with stereotype. Oh, China. We keep on talking about a place called China. China is the size of Europe. And the provinces in China are the size of European countries with populations to match. Uh, nonetheless, we're surprised when we start visiting that the food is different in different regions. They speak different languages. They have different wedding customs, burial customs, on and on and on and on. So Jeremy's experience in Hainan, you know, they were labeling him as it, welcoming him. But, you know, you're a lot like those mainlanders over there. Uh, so it really brings out regional difference, which we have uh, in this country as well. And a lot nicer weather down there than uh, <laughs> elsewhere. Outside of your own stories, of course, uh, what favorites did you have from this book that were particularly amusing or poignant for you? Yeah, I have one. I mean, there are a lot of them. There's just so many different types of stories in here. It's hard to pick one or two out. But the one I'd like to draw attention to is one called Eating Bitterness. Uh, and it was written uh, by Vera Schwartz, who spent uh, virtually the entirety of her academic career at Wesleyan University. Uh, and visited China early on. I think she was there around 1980 uh, as a student. Uh, and then she comes back in 1989 and she talks about something in this piece called Eating Bitterness that happened in 1989. She was at uh, Beijing University uh, on this visit, research visit in 1989. But she linked up with an old friend of hers, someone who was a classmate of hers from 1980. And uh, life had changed for both of them. Uh, her friend had gotten married uh, and uh, had a child, I think seven or eight years old uh, girl. And Vera had a, brought her son along, who was the same age. And so they, not only did they link up as two old friends, but they had the kids function as playmates for each other. Okay, wonderful. This is a great story. And reconnecting after almost 10 years. Uh, but then something, from Vera's point of view, totally unexpected happened. Uh, she noticed that her friend showed signs of battery. And it finally came out one day. She talks about this admission that her friend makes, that her husband beat her up almost every day. What? You know, why? These, you know... This is impossible to explain. Well, it turned out to be a byproduct, among other things, but mainly a byproduct of the one-child policy put into effect in the late 1970s. Uh, and when this friend of hers got married, uh, about a year later, she had a child, and the child was a girl. And the husband was absolutely furious. It was her fault that the child was a girl and not a boy. And since they could only have one child, this was absolutely horrific and, and horrendous news. Uh, but instead of it being said and over with and done with when the child was born, he brought this subject up every single day and engaged in uh, domestic violence. Uh, and this was already, you know, multiple years later, and he was still doing it. And Avira was uh, obviously distraught uh, upon hearing this because it was clear that the woman loved her daughter so much and the kids got along so well. But to, but to know that this was happening every day and to feel helpless about doing anything about it and then to eventually leave China and leave the friend and her daughter behind was, was very, very painful. And so there's this vague expression in Chinese, it means having a hard time, going through difficulty, literally eating bitterness 
Venice. And Vera said she never thought about the expression in the same way again, even though it was a familiar expression to her. Uh, having it come out in this context was, uh, you know, gave her a whole new uh, feeling for the ultimate meaning of the term. Strongly recommend that story. Mm-hmm. Very. Like Paul, I have a lot that I would like to uh, strongly recommend and can't possibly go through all of them. Uh, two that come up, that have the same kind of aha moment occur to me. One is by Charlotte Firth from the early 1980s called No Signs, No Maps. And the other by Tom Gorman called Where Are We Going? That's 1984. And they make the same point that there are no maps in China in the early 1980s that ordinary people can can uh, use. Uh, Charlotte shows up at Beijing University looking for the uh, building where her office is and where her classes are, and she knows the number of the building, but she doesn't know where it is, and there's no map at the entrance to the university, and she can't find anyone anywhere. So she asks around, and she finally finds it, but then reflects on the fact that why are there no maps? and comes to realize that here is a culture, or a political culture anyway, where you either know where you're going and why, or you don't go there. There's no reason to put out a general map for the public to view. Tom Gorman, who's a businessman, who very successful in Hong Kong for many years, uh, on a trip to Sichuan in 1984, goes from Chengdu to another city and asks, you know, where are we going? Well, it's about an hour and a half south of here. Yeah, but uh, where? Well, we'll bring you in the car. And then he realized that that's normal talk. People identify where they're going by how they're going to get there and how much time it takes, but there's no map. Uh, Again, Uh, Of course, that's changed now. You can buy maps in China at the time, but in the Maoist era and the post-Mao era, the idea that ordinary people don't need to know the lay of the land, almost in a literal sense, became an aha moment for both of them. Another piece that I really love, so much that I wrote a fan letter to Stanley Rosen uh, in 1985, wrote about an experience in 1985 called Old Lady where he is uh, working for the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations as an escort interpreter for delegations of various kinds in China. And in Xi'an, they go to a tourist shop where there's calligraphy and other artifacts and paper cuts and so on. But out on the sidewalk, there's this woman, not old at the time, middle-aged, who had her own little setup to sell these things. In the time... At the time in China, it was new that you could be your own individual entrepreneur, your own guti hu, and she was that, and she's trying to fend for herself and make money on the sidewalk, even though the location on the sidewalk is illegal, so every now and then she's pushed away by police. Once, when Stanley is there talking to her about her wares, the police come along and push her away, but in the process push him away too, and the two of them are there on the sidewalk together, and because he's a foreigner, the police need to back off and give her space that normally she can't have. Uh, So they, in short, become friends. (laughs) And every time uh, Stanley, in later years, goes back to Xi'an, he makes it a point to look for her. Uh, She had brought him to his home, and they had sort of made a friendship. Until one trip, he came, and he couldn't find her, and he asked, and she had died. And then he wrote this uh, essay, looking back on it, a very simple story, in a sense, about how this American professor from Southern California befriends a middle-aged Chinese woman who later... uh, There was no romantic relationship here. This was one person connecting with another and then having her disappear. Always she was so thankful that he would show up because he could help her sell some of her wares and uh, make her individual entrepreneurship a little more successful. But I love the piece so much because it's 
It's so simple, and yet it cuts through to what Paul was saying earlier about the connection between human beings. Two people from very different backgrounds, very different educational levels, speaking di different languages except that Stanley could use Chinese with her. Uh, and yet they connect, and at a human level, you just feel poignance for, poignancy for this, this old lady that he met. Jeremy. Um, like Perry, I'm going to cheat here and, and choose more than one. Um, That's okay. But I'll choose uh, all from the same Choose author. wisely. <laughs> uh, these ones are kind of a trilogy from Mayfair Young. And I think in terms of what the, what the book does and what the book's trying to do, it gives uh, her three pieces, all from 1982, uh, My Father's Hometown, Second Uncle and His Wife, uh, and then the local officials, whiffs of the Qing dynasty. For anybody who reads these, and I, I won't go into all the, the, the wonderful details, but for anybody who reads these, you'll very quickly know what I'm talking about when I say you get a visceral sense of what it was like in, to be in her shoes. And, and she gives such a vivid account of her, of her experience. And I think also, I, th I think uniquely in the book, contacting relatives, going to a village to contact her own family members, reconnecting with family, and having having these a, a, a series of episodes that she encounters here. And there's a there's a kind of wholeness to her account, I think, in, in these three pieces because they actually originally were a single piece that that we decided in conversation with Mayfair to to to, to put into these these three separate pieces. But they give they they, they have a kind of a, a kind of whole account of the experience that extends really from, 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 from the politics of the Qing Empire, politics of, of Mao Zedong and, and Mao Zedong thought, right down to the, to the very, very visceral experience of living in this house, visiting her family members. And, and you, you can taste the food, you can smell the smells, and you really are uh, transported when you read Mayfair's uh, Three Pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do I get another story? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I should have ended the first uh, story about uh, Vera Schwartz's encounter with her old friend at uh, Beijing University and the domestic violence issue related to the one-child family policy. There's a new documentary film that just came out. I saw it a couple of nights ago called One Child Nation. And it's exactly on this topic of the consequences, some intended, some unintended, of the one-child family policy. And I uh, strongly recommend people see the film. It's very engaging, disturbing as well. But the other story I wanted to mention uh, is uh, called Brotherhood. And this was a story written by Jeffrey Zeibard, who uh, ended up in a business community, not an academic, but somebody doing business in China. And way back in 1987, he was a student in China uh, at Fudan University. But it turned out that he had a hobby, and the hobby was martial arts. And it was partly keeping in shape and all of that. And so he linked up uh, in a club with guys who were hardcore martial artists, a bunch of local guys. And this was something he did all the time, really loved the guys. And then, uh, you know, sometimes after a workout, they'd go to a restaurant and have a bite to eat and so forth. And it was a brotherhood, and they, they called him brother. Uh, he was one of the brothers, simple as that. And this is what I mean earlier when today when we were referring to the, uh, uh, the, the humanity of the kinds of contacts and interactions that we're concerned about. Uh, here he is, a, a foreigner, American foreigner, and uh, they're calling him brother. Uh, and they're welcoming him into their martial arts group. They share this in common. Okay, wonderful experience with these guys. And then he left China. He said he was back about five years later and linked up again with one of the brothers. And uh, it was his wedding and so forth. He got invited to the wedding. And, you know, this was super cool. The, 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 the relationship was ongoing. And it was only at another... <laughs> round of drinking as some of the friends got together that they told him a story of which he was 100% unaware that it happened five years earlier before he left China. They were at one of their usual dinners following uh, a martial arts workout and he didn't know this but some people at another table had insulted him 
and the brothers had heard this, but nobody said anything. No, no one did anything. And, uh, you know, Jeffrey was unaware that this even happened. It was over by, he left China. Five years later, they told him this story that a number of nights later, long after Jeffrey had left, a number of nights later, the brothers went back to the restaurant, found the same guys who were at the other table who had insulted their brother, and a wild fight broke out <laughs> in which they punched out all these guys. And he said, when they, when, when they told him the story, he was completely blown away. Uh, he hadn't even been aware of the insult, but to them it was so important that one of their brothers had been insulted uh, needlessly and recklessly, and those... <laughs> Other guys had to pay the price, uh, and uh, he calls his story brotherhood. And again, this this humanity, uh, global humanity that 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 sinks in here. What can we learn from these tales of early post Nixon, post normalization visits to China? What do they teach us uh, in the context of the U.S. China relationship today? I think it go, goes back to some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, in terms of the the people-to-people -people diplomacy, that kind of public diplomacy idea, um, and how important it is, but also that it takes some doing, and and this is something that that we certainly get now, and what some people are calling a kind of return to the sort of Cold War stances. At, at least some some people watching the, the Sino-U.S. relation relationship are saying that it's it's moving back in that direction. Now, hopefully not. Hopefully in a different direction, but but that that idea of Having the official narrative being being very being being quite powerful in certain circles, and I think what all of the authors here have in common is that they spent a lot of time in China, and moving past these narratives takes some doing. It's it's very easy to 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 slip into the narrative of of Washington or Beijing about any given subject, whether it's Hainan or anything else. It's very easy to slip into that narrative and and tell that story because you're going to have this enormous force behind you saying, yeah, let's tell that story, whether it's Washington or Beijing or, or, or someone else. And it takes some doing and it takes some time and it takes the establishment of trust and, and long-term relationships to move past that and to start getting into a more nuanced story. And so hopefully what we, what we tried to do with this was distill a few of those moments. Uh, and, and they really are distilled. There's a lot behind them. There's a lot uh, behind each one of these stories, I think a lot of emotion and experience and, and a lot of learning that goes into each one of these stories that, that involves what it takes to move beyond official narratives, to, to not simply tout an official line, but go deeper and make those connections. What I really enjoyed about this book is reading about all these early travelers, all, all these China trippers, it's so interesting to, to read about these times back then, the 70s and 80s. It seems we're so innocent compared to now. So that's something that I really uh, particularly enjoyed. Are there any big takeaways from the book or do you hope the readers will just, you know, make what they will of these anecdotes or what do you hope people will get out of this? I'll start by following up on the previous question of Sino-American relations and what have we learned. I think this book for that topic of Sino-American relations tells us that it's not just Beijing and Washington's relationship. Normally in the, uh, world, the news world, in the academic world in the United States, when we use the phrase Sino-American relations, we mean uh, the Wai Jiaobu in Beijing and the State Department in the U.S. and government to government. But what this book richly shows is that there's all kinds of people-to-people -people relationships with a small p there, non-political, in education, in business, in Paul's wife and my wife are both Chinese. It's not just a Sino-American relations is something much bigger than government-to-government -government relations. And We've said this before, too, but I'll stress it again. What I think this book does is to humanize Chinese people and to build a connection between them as human beings and we as human beings. Many people know that I've been blacklisted and can't travel to China. I haven't been there since my night at the Movenpick. And one question people often ask is, what do you feel like being persona non grata in the country to which you've devoted your life. 
And I honestly say that's not a problem for me. It never has been a problem for me because in my mind, the way I feel, I haven't been rejected by China, quote unquote. The Chinese government won't give me a visa, but most of my friends in this world are Chinese. My wife is Chinese. My children are half Chinese. My life, I speak Chinese at home. So government to government relations are almost an epiphenomenon on top of much richer and deeper human relationships. And this book is a good way to see that in all kinds of examples. Yeah, let me add here too, just again, building on all of this, uh, let me talk about something we might call the learning curve. Uh, and when you've had no access and no exposure, I think about North Korea today, uh, you don't really know what's going to happen when you start visiting places. And and you're right, we put in a lot of time. It wasn't always easy to push back and to try to get those, you know, access to homes, access to ordinary people and so forth, things we do take take for granted today. It wasn't easy doing it. Uh, and in the process, learning, you know, we're a bunch of idiots too. There are so many things we, we don't know. Uh, and uh, that's why we want to emphasize in the book, we're not just learning about China, we're learning about ourselves uh, and the limitations of the sorts of stereotypes that we knowingly or unknowingly bought into. So it's a two-way street though. So when I first started going to China in 71, all the way up to 1979, at the University of California, we had no students from China other than the students from, let's say, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Chinese-speaking students from Taiwan, Hong Kong, or American-born Chinese, but people who were passport-holding citizens of the People's Republic. There were none. The first academic delegation we got here was in 1979, and they wanted to, uh, they invited us to welcome what they called visiting scholars from China. This was the initial breakthrough, but it took until 1979, and these were all people who were associated professors or so in China who were 10 years behind in the sciences because of the Cultural Revolution. And so they weren't looking for a degree, and they didn't have the money, frankly, to, 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 to you know, pay for a degree. And so they were looking to be put into labs and to do catch-up work. Okay, fast forward, where are we now? Beginning in the 80s, we actually got degree-seeking students starting to trickle in in very, very low numbers to get an MA, uh, a PhD, or a, or a BA degree. Okay, now, here we are, 2019, uh, at, the, at our campus, where we're sitting today, we have over 5,000 students from China who are passport-holding students from China. Southern California, which would include UCLA, USC, uh, Riverside, you know, all the campuses in Southern California, there are over 40,000 passport-holding students from China. So this raises the whole question, what about their America tripping? You know, they've come to America starting with that first group in 79 that came to our campus as visiting scholars. What the heck was going through their mind uh, on a daily basis, struggling with the language and cultural patterns and the diversity in our culture, and then com coming all the way up to the present day. And so one of the things that we try to encourage in the aftermath of finishing this book is promoting the idea with our colleagues who were born, raised, educated in China, and then began tripping to America to come up with a similar book. Maybe call it America Tripping. I don't know what they'll call it. But we really would like to see the same thing happen because we have a strong feeling these same kinds of stories will emerge. I thought X, Y, and Z. Aha, now I get it. <laughs> uh, this sort of thing. Reflecting on their own ignorance and the biases and prejudices of our own society that they had to confront. So uh, we hope that's one of the takeaways. We very much hope to see uh, a sequel volume come out and which tells the other side of the story. Hmm. So are there any final thoughts you might like to add to this discussion? Well, I think your listeners will be, whether they're from China or the United States or some other place, they will be vividly aware that the political moment at the highest levels of power is not very good at the moment. Relations between official, let's call them official relations between China and the United States, a lot of finger pointing, a lot of name calling. It's really ugly. Uh, and it's in the news all the time. It dominates the newspaper. And it's real. There's something going on at that level. Uh, I think what one of the things we're trying to say in the book is that people don't be 
discouraged by that. Let's maintain the kinds of contacts that we talk about in the book. Uh, let's avoid getting mired down in that kind of ugly uh, interchange. And let's keep the, let's call it people-to-people -people, uh, diplomacy, people-to-people -people, uh, relations uh, alive and well in this particularly bad political moment. Yeah, the people-to-people uh, -people relations will be that cushion to protect us from the sharp edges at the, at the very top level. Well put. Well, this has been most informative, interesting, and enlightening. Thank you, Perry Link, <laughs> Paul Pickowitz, and Jeremy Murray. The book is called China Tripping, Encountering the Everyday in the People's Republic, new from Roman and Littlefield. We'll have links to purchase the book at both the China History Podcast and 21st Century China Center websites. And our special thanks to the 21st Century China Center for co-producing this effort and lending us their sumptuous recording studios. This truly was one of the pleasures of my life to have been given this opportunity. Thank you all. This is Laszlo Montgomery of the China History Podcast, signing off from the sprawling campus of the University of California, San Diego. Thanks to everyone for listening. We hope you enjoyed this. Take care.